Hello, New Brunswick, and welcome to New Brunswick Tonight. My name is Charlie Cradiville, and I'll be your host. We've got a very special guest who's joining us in studio. In just a moment, I'll be talking to Daryl Lamont Jenkins. Uh, Mr. Jenkins has uh, been the executive director of One People's Project, the anti-fascist uh, organization that he has founded in our city um, back in uh, uh, the early 2000s. We're going to be talking to him about the history of that organization and uh, some of his accomplishments as well as the new documentary, Alt-Right Age of Rage, which just came out. Uh, Mr. Jenkins just did an event this weekend here in New Brunswick to celebrate the release and uh, it was a pleasure getting to meet him and hear about his history and the history of his work with One People's Project and uh, you can look for this new film it's going to be on your uh, cable providers video on demand service or you can also find it on YouTube at Amazon Prime and other places where you stream films and we're going to talk to him about all that in just a moment. For now, take a quick look at the, uh, this is just the first couple minutes of that film. This is the trailer for Alt-Right Age of Rage, featuring our friend Daryl Lamont Jenkins. The alt-right is an abbreviation of alternative right. The phrase was coined in 2008 by a very alt-right guy named Richard Spencer. He hooked up with a guy named Paul Gottfried, who is a college professor or some small college somewhere, who once gave a speech saying that we need an alternative right. Spencer turned that term, alternative right, into the name of his new blog that he started writing. And to give you an idea of how bad that blog was, they once had an article suggesting that maybe we should start trying black genocide, killing off all black people. Regardless of whether or not a person has the right to say whatever they want to say, the fact of the matter is when they make it clear that they're fascist, you're supposed to do something about it to make sure that those particular rights are intact. Otherwise, you're doing nothing more than copping out because you're too cowardly to put up a fight. Daryl the Barrel, as he's known, he weighs at least 400 pounds. He's this anti-fascist activist who's done all sorts of research and has dedicated his life to hating people, you know, basically. I don't have kids of my own. I have nieces and nephews. I hope that they are able to learn something from what it is that I do. I'm not begrudging Antifa of trying to remain anonymous and trying to remain inconspicuous in the work that they do. But I can't do that, and that's one of the reasons why. My family needs to know, and the people around me need to know that this is what I am. This is what I do, and I'm damn proud of it. And I want you to learn something from all of that.
our side was were defending themselves to a large degree. I have no doubt about that. Does this day feel like a win to you? It does feel like a win because we demonstrated our resolve. Everything falls apart from this day. But yeah. everybody knows them now. Everybody's yeah. seen them now. And when they go home to their families and to their jobs and to their professions, everybody's going to say, why were you there? We condemn in the strongest possible terms this egregious display of hatred, bigotry, and violence on many sides. On many sides. What about the alt-left that came charging at the, as you say, the alt-right? Do they have any semblance of guilt? You had a group on one side that was bad, and you had a group on the other side that was also very violent. And nobody wants to say that. The idea that I would ever back down to such a little creep like Mayor Siner. We are never backing down. Now it's not going to be over. Now it's not over. Never. <laughs> And welcome back. That was the trailer for the new documentary, Alt-Right, Age of Rage. I'm sitting here with one of the folks who was featured prominently in that film, Mr. Daryl Lamont Jenkins. Thank you so much for How joining you doing? us. How you doing? <laughs> I'm good. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Yes, we want to talk about your organization, mm -hmm. One People's Project, and how that came about. It actually started here in New Brunswick. How did you yeah. even end up in New Brunswick well, in the first it, place? Well, I, from here. Sort of. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in Somerset. I grew up in Somerset. So, um, you know, around, uh, you know, I was in the music scene here when we had four clubs, um, four or five. Sure, and, sure. Uh, you know, but I was also still involved with the uh, political scene, or at least the activist scene here as well. I used to be associated with a crew down here called uh, New Jersey Freedom Organization. And it was... Uh, really kind of like a labor of love with them, um, but there was other things that I needed to do that really wasn't being focused on um, here in New Jersey because you don't deal a lot with the right wing or neo-fascist nonsense here in this state as hardcore as you would in any other part of the country. Mm -hmm. And when it started coming here, um, by that time it started coming here really hardcore in say 99, 2000, I was already studying up on these clowns and getting ideas of who's who and what's what. So you had yourself a former Rutgers alum named Richard Barrett, who was going, to, who was current, who was living in Mississippi at the time, um, who decided he was going to hold himself a rally in Morristown, New Jersey, on July Fourth, two thousand. Mm -hmm. We wanted to have a counter demo uh, to oppose it, so we called it the One People's Rally. And it was just going to be a festival where we had speakers, we had bands playing, we were going to basically drown him out and all that. And we were successful in that. And after the rally, because some people did in fact get arrested, sadly, uh, you had some, we had some people that said, you know what, we should keep, we had a website that was coordinating it at the time, coordinating the efforts that we were um, engaging in to combat the uh, rally. And... Afterwards, we said we wanted to keep the website going so people could still get information about how to help folks that were arrested, um, where do we go from here, who are other um, neo-fascists, and not just in New Jersey, but around the country and perhaps around the world, who are the folks that we really need to be focusing on. And that's really the beginning of um, One People's Project. Okay, and so yeah. you guys have like developed into an organization where you do a lot of uh, reporting, right? Correct, you, right. You're basically well, looking into the, uh, you know extremist, racist culture, uh, and exposing folks who are a part of it? Is that fair to say? Exactly. exactly. See, I think people should understand this. I am a reporter by vocation. I mean, I used to write for uh, the black, a black weekly here in New Jersey called The City News. I was a columnist for The Courier News. Oh, okay. I, was, um, I used to write all kinds of letters to the editor for, throughout the 90s. Uh, and I was an editor of uh, my newspaper in Franklin, Somerset Spectator. You know, so this, this is what I did. And 
my attitude was the best way that I can combat these clowns is to write about them. Because one thing I noticed about the far right in New Jersey is that they were afraid of their own shadow. And I figured that that was pretty much going to be the same all over the country. Because the dodging that they, that they engage in when it comes to uh, their neo-fascist politics, their racist politics, is ridiculous. And you needed to basically explain why you are calling them a racist. Why are you calling them a fascist and all that? Because they was basically involving, uh, engaging in all kinds of subterfuge, subterfuge and um, convoluted points. So I said, you know what? The heck with all that. We're just going to tell you exactly what it is that we see in these clowns and why you should be concerned. See, That's what One People's Project is about. And the first place that One People's Project was based was... 230 Sanford 230 Street. 230 Sanford Street. So earlier right today here. I actually went to the, uh, uh, the, the site, if we could put up the picture. This is the, ho the home. Uh, the birthplace of One People's home. Project. Where yes. One People's Project started. Still standing to this Still day. Well, well, hopefully it's remains standing after because I'm not there anymore, people. <laughs> You're but, just going to aggravate some innocence. But, but, yeah, but so, so yeah. tell us about what it was like starting that organization well, and how kind of, important the scene well, was. Well, it was important because, you know, it was NJFO that was basically spearheading the um, action against, uh, against what was going on in Morristown. We needed a place to just meet up. Um, and we originally met up in Newark at my, um, at my grandmother's house. And... Because that's where a couple, a lot of the people, People's Organization for Progress, and sure, some sure. of the Green Party members were, you know, based in that general area. But I live here, so everybody went to my apartment on the first floor, and <laughs> and we all just discussed how we was going to put this together, and we just kept on maintaining the website was basically developed there, and 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 as time went along, it wasn't just shutting down that rally, but a couple of months later in Manville, they decided to come back um, and hold an award ceremony for those who attended their little rally, and we shut that down, because it was at the VFW Hall, and they called it a financial planning seminar to get the hall. <laughs> <laughs> and when we made noise about it in, in the news, and we started writing out press releases, uh, all of a sudden the folks in Manville were like, no, we can't have this here. The so the VFW, the town yes, didn't want it. Yeah. VFW shut it down, and they stood there, and, and we went there. We heard that they were shutting it down, so we said, "All right, cancel the protest. We're not going to go there in March or anything like that. Let's just go over there and see what show, see what comes of our efforts." So we went there, and this was like October of two thousand, and we saw that the mayor was there. We saw that the VFW is there, and. Uh, and they were just waiting for people to show up. And they said, well, why don't we go say hi? We were on the same side. Yeah, yeah. So we went up there, said hello, and told them what our concerns were. Um, the mayor gave us his card and says, if there's ever any kind of situation like this again, um, just give me a call. And then all the Nazis, there was only a few of them um, that showed up, and they told him, go home. Um, one guy, John Kuchek, who was the uh, VFW um, member that um, booked the hall, He's he's also he was also at the time a, a member of the Populist Party, which was a white supremacist organization here in the state of New Jersey, and uh, he started complaining of the chest pains, and they uh, he he left in an ambulance. So I said, okay, I guess our work is done here, and at, and I after that I just went on a week long tour with Inspector Seven, and I came back and says, okay, let's continue this work. <laughs> famous New Brunswick uh, band. Yeah. Oh no no yeah, there was two famous New Brunswick band. I mean. I, it was like that day, that weekend, I, um, I caused some grief to some Nazis. And then a day or so later, I'm on, t I'm on tour playing Roadie to inspect the seven, Bouncing Souls, Mustard Plug, and Youth Brigade. Not Youth Brigade. Was it Youth Brigade? No, it wasn't Youth Brigade. <laughs> My brother, I can't. Maybe it was Youth Brigade. But uh, <laughs> some, some great local acts. It was Youth Brigade. It was Youth Brigade, yes. Yeah, and, and so t tell me about that music scene and how important it was towards building this whole uh, organization. Well, of well here's the fun part about all of this. Is if you're going to be anti-fascist, if you're going to be anti-fa, here in um, the States, anti-fa was born out of the punk scene, you know. I mean, when you start talking about the folks who were really serious about making sure the Nazis didn't have a hold in their scene, their society, their culture, it was definitely the punks that said, no, you're leaving. Mm -hmm. And and they have been fighting them since like 89 in other parts of the country. 
and um, anti-racist action was formed in like 88 or 89 at, um, in Minneapolis and it just spread all over the uh, all over the US for some strange reason it didn't get here until 2000 and you know because of that because of the fact that you know punks are all about yo whenever we see a situation that we want fixed we're gonna fix it we're gonna create our own um, established order, uh, not orders but established um, establishments we're gonna have our own newspapers our own record labels I mean everything was DIY and when it came to politics same exact thing um, Neo-Nazism was a concern within our politics, so we said uh, within our scene, so we said, okay, we're gonna um, we're gonna combat that because no one else seems to be interested, mm -hmm. and that was the birth of Antifa straight out of the punk scene. So you know, it was a natural fit for me. Plus, aside from the fact that I was in, um, I was a skin at the time and I was a punk at the time, um, I'm also a black man, yes, and it has always been a concern. Uh, as to where my people were going to go and what were our roadblocks. When I was a kid, I was concerned about what happened when the civil rights movement ended. Where did all the people who opposed us go? And you were reading your weekly reader um, exactly where they went because there'll be stories um, and then weekly reader was what sh the newspaper that you would get when you was like in the fifth grade or something like that. Mm -hmm. And there will be stories about the Klan. And it was like, okay, so they're still around. What are we going to do about it? Now, when you're 10 years old, 10, 11 years old, you don't have that answer. But when you go into the Air Force, like I did, and you see these knuckleheads show up again on Oprah, you said, okay, I'm going to start documenting it. And this was in 1987, mind you. I'm just going to start documenting all these idiots and just learn who they are and what they're about. And then you started noticing that uh, folks in the mainstream, right, the conservatives, the Republicans started talking like them and said, okay, I guess we got to follow them now. And that was a good idea because Bob Grant was on talk radio allowing these neo-Nazis to give their contact information over his airwaves. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, now, now I'm just going to follow everybody on the right. And by the time One People's Project came along, I was just a one-man treasure trove to that kind of information. Still am to this day. Yeah, you're, you're one, of the, <laughs> one of the very best resources for information about these uh, you know, extreme movements. Mm -hmm. And tell me how this work has changed over these 18 years that you've been doing it uh, as an organization. You know, obviously, we, you know, the, the well, main point of the film is the alt-right is uh, achieving some, uh, you know, well, attention, right? They're getting well, a lot of attention these days. You've been on the case a lot longer. Mm -hmm. Tell me how it's changed over Well, time. for one thing, I should stress that it, obviously it's not just me. There's a whole bunch of other groups out there. I mentioned that anti-racist action. You had Red and Anarchist Skinheads Rash. You had Sharp Skinheads Against Racial Prejudice. Um, you, you had a whole bunch of other groups that were out there as well. Um, but I, within One Piece Project, you had um, you have some folks. We have folks in like Pittsburgh and D.C. and all that. Over the past 18 years, you know, I think they started, we started really putting the pressure on them. The internet happened, so it was a lot easier to get the information out about these characters. Um, and around 2005, that was really beneficial because they started downplaying all the trappings of white supremacy in order to get over politically and mainstream. So they started... Um, just like avoiding things like the swastikas on on their more popular sites, the swastikas, the burning crosses, anything that will basically peg them immediately as fascist Start to use or more, more coded language and dog right. whistles, and right? Stuff. And uh, and um and it worked for them to some degree, but unfortunately, those of us who knew the characters that were involved knew exactly who they were, and we were telling them. So we was able to shut down conferences. We was able to kick people out of their jobs. Get um. Um, destroy their political chances or what have you and it's really over the past two and a half years where they tried to start pushing back because of Donald Trump mm -hmm. so now it's changed into the battle has been joined because it's not just us folks that are always in the street getting in their faces causing them all kinds of grief now we got regular people saying, you know what, this is a problem, especially after Charlottesville. They said, you know what, we can't ignore this anymore, despite what our media is telling us to do, despite what our, our, our leaders are telling us to do, ignore them and they will go away. That's a lie. They do not go away until you make them go away. And, and society's picking up on that. And 
It remains to be seen where we go from here because Trump's still in office. Um, they may not be feeling their oats, the Nazis may not be feeling their oats as much as they did before Charlottesville, but they're still out there trying to do something. And, uh, and the rest of us are just going to maintain that vigilance to try to just basically push it back and shut it down, bury it. Right. And so, um, you know, you actually, you go all over the country, mm -hmm. um, to research and expose and there's, you know, you're, right. you're well known by, uh, folks on both sides, right, of the and, issue, and, right? And so there's, there's folks who are Nazis who know you very well. More because so than a lot you, of the Because you show up at all their events. And you, more so, yeah. yes, because it's weird. I am, for a very long time, and I think I made points to this in the documentary, for a very long time, I was no more on the right than I was on the left. Because, you know, I can go to the rallies, I can network with my people anytime. But we wanted to know more about, we, we really wanted to get into the heads of those that we were dealing with so we can tell people what the hell it is we were dealing with. So, you know, we would spend a lot more time amongst right wingers, either incognito or just straight up in their face, by ourselves. I mean, the Conservative Political Action Conference is a perfect example of that. I mean, we call it, it's called CPAC, but this is the thing that happens every year in D.C. where right wingers... Um, conservatives and uh, we're talking elected officials, um, media sure. folks, you know, they all just get together and just bounce ideas off each other on how to subvert our world, our mm -hmm. society. And this place was basically what I call the hunting grounds. It still is. Because even though they started realizing that folks were paying attention to the fact that they had Nazis amongst their midst, um, and they do kick them out when they're that obvious, they don't kick them all out. Mm -hmm. So I'm at CPAC two years ago. Richard Spencer was there. I'm causing him grief. And they throw him out um, on my assistance because I'm friends with some of the folks that run CPAC. But you go downstairs to all their tables and booths, and there's still um, organizations like Marine Le Pen's group. Mm -hmm. um, it's called ENF. Um, Europe for Nations and Folk, I believe is some the initials are. Um, so some still slip under the radar. So the mission is to make sure none of them do. Mm -hmm. and, and so tell me about, uh, you know, New Jersey. And, you know, like you said, not exactly the number one place for uh, white supremacist organizations, no. but there's definitely some organizations, definitely some people. Tell us about, you know, what you've seen. Well, there's, the, the, there's, some groups, there's some groups out there that are definitely trying. I mean, you have... You have this group that's just popping up out of nowhere called the uh, New Jersey European American something or another. <laughs> uh, they showed up at um, in D.C. at um, the anniversary of the Unite the Right rally that took place in Charlottesville. The anniversary rally was held in D.C. and they showed up. Um, you've had groups like the Atlantic City quote unquote skinheads back in the day. You have um, you had groups like the Advanced White Society. The National Socialist Movement had a uh, had a presence here in, uh, here in the state. And then there was a group called uh, the National Youth Front, which was run by a guy named Angelo John Gage that was started in California. Um, he was the second, about just only a few years ago, and they've already had about four or five leaders. Angelo John Gage was the second one because the first one they had to kick out because he married somebody of color. Um, Angelo John Gage started harassing Rutgers, mm -hmm. started flyering Rutgers, and because he didn't like what a um, what some what a professor in this area did and in, in this campus did said, and uh, and that's the basically ha basic hallmark of the National Youth Front. He eventually left, and um, and the head of it became Nathan Domingo. Now at this point, National Youth Front got in trouble because that name was already trademarked, so they had to change their name. That name now is Identity Europa. Mm -hmm. Europa is spelled E V R O P A. So Nathan Domingo was running ident running the group as Identity Europa. Um, he eventually um, bowed out of the leadership, even though he's still involved. And then somebody named Elliot Klein, who calls himself Eli Mosley, took over. He got bounced because um, they found out that he lied about um, going out to Iraq. And now it's being run by someone named Patrick Casey. Rutgers is. Um, where they like to basically um, hang their hat, it seems, mm -hmm. these days. So you see their flyers trying to harass yet another professor, and 
and they try to make their presence known. But the cute thing about um, about the group is that they know that if they are revealed, that the, um, the people involved are revealed, we're going to cause them all kinds of hell once we realize who they are. Um, Charlottesville had um, made um, made a lot of neo Nazis and neo fascists gun shy now because they realized that they cannot get away with the stuff that they were pretty much getting away with for a year and a half thanks to Donald Trump anymore because, yeah, Donald Trump is about to get their behinds kicked. So they said, okay, we got to lay low, we got to chill. So Identity Europa, what they do is that they hold these flash mobs instead of just announcing rallies, knowing full well that we'll show up. Mm -hmm. And they, and they um, secretly plaster the um, city and the campus with, with their flyers. And... Frankly, that's cowardly, but by the same token, yeah, thank you for making us feel better that you can't show your face. Thank you for that. <laughs> so tell folks out there, you know, what they should do or what you think that, you know, because like I know you actually go, mm -hmm. go all out and you sometimes, uh, you know, open, open a door to people leaving the white power movement right. and you've, you've successfully helped people get out. What what do you think you know, you know folks who you, might not be up for for that challenge? You, you don't have do. to. You do, you don't have to. The whole thing is when we come up with this information, when we start reporting on this stuff and start making it available to everyone, use it. Because if you hear, for example, in Jersey City, that there is a public defender that's associated with one of the white supremacist groups, Council of Conservative Citizens, and has been written about in magazines, he has to go. Because somebody that is caught up in the system might be in his, sure. basically, on his caseload. And then that means that person doesn't have adequate representation when he has to go, he or she has to go before court. Mm -hmm. So if that person is of color, so that person cannot be a viable officer of the court. He cannot do his job as a public defender. Because he's already made it clear that his mission is to more or less destroy people who aren't white. So he has to go. The only way you're going to be able to um, know that is if you do all the reporting as we do. But once we do that reporting and hand it to somebody, now it's time to be proactive against these id idiots. So, so you're, you're encouraging people to get out there and read the reports that are already mm -hmm. on yes. the website. is idavox.com, right? idavox.com, named after Ida B. Wells because Ida B. Wells was... Um, one of the first people who started doing this, she had her own newspapers back in the day. Yes, and she wrote about lynching and started promoting yeah. anti-lynching laws and such. That was her mission. So she was really responsible for a lot of the lynchings and, and the oppression that was going on at that time being put on being record. Exposed, yeah. That's what we're doing today on Ida Vox and to some degree on One People's Project still. Um, One People's Project is our, OnePeople'sProject.com is our original website and now it's our organizational website. Mm -hmm. So we say to go to both and, and, and learn as much as you can so you can be proactive against these against these elements so that they do not cause us to be polarized, so that we do not cause dissension amongst each other. So they don't cause dissension amongst each other, I should say. That's that's what we should be doing. We need to be proactive. We need to maintain a vigilance against these elements before they cause us harm. All right. Um, before we go, I want you to say a few words about the film. Mm -hmm. I know uh, this is kind of a, a, a big deal. So, yeah. uh, uh, I watched the film this, this uh, weekend in New Brunswick, and it's... Uh, really in depth, uh, you know, and, and a lot of it features you and your work, and uh, um, it's very eye-opening um, film. Can you tell me about the process of, of being a, a subject of the documentary? Well, the, um, the name of the movie is called Alt Right Age of Rage, as everyone knows, and it was directed by Adam Balalo. He's had done a number of uh, documentaries in the past. Um, last year, he um, he did a documentary called The New Radicals. And beforehand, he has he had did documentaries on Lee Scratch Perry, and he did one on Little Wayne called The Carter. So um, so he's out there. People know who he is. He has done this work, and he wanted to do a documentary on Trump's first year. So he was going around the country. Him and his producer Alex Needles um, were going around the country, interviewing everyone on both sides, and. They had a lot of they had a lot of material, and they were and they came to me, and I helped them out with a lot of um, 
with a lot of uh, things that they needed. I was interviewed. I told them they didn't need to go to this rally and that rally. And they did, and they got a lot of inf um, a lot of material from that. And they were done with the documentary in July of 2017. Wow. And I told them, look, you're really going to have to go to Charlottesville next month because everyone is going there, and you're more than likely to get a lot more footage that you can use for the movie, for the documentary. So they had a crew go out to Charlottesville, and... It changed the entire scope of the film. They sure. realized that it wasn't about Trump anymore. It was about what was going on in those streets. Mm -hmm. It was about what was going on on the internet and in those boardrooms. And it turned into a documentary about myself versus Richard Spencer, the uh, executive director of the National Policy Institute, and somebody that we had been following since 2006. Long before anybody even knew who he was. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people only um, first heard of him in 2018. And when they were trying to figure out who the heck he was, we were the ones they went to to find out. So because of our knowledge and because of how we was able to explain exactly what was going on, it simply became a, a documentary about the both sides represented by myself and Spencer. Yeah, and tell us a little bit about your experience at Charlottesville. It was a really uh, tragic moment for the country, and I know uh, you, you know you were down there, and I'm mm -hmm. sure a lot of your uh, you know you know friends and allies. Were. I got to tell you, it, it's weird. It's weird because you know you're dealing with. Um, I've done. I've been through this before. I mean, back in um, 2012, there was a similar rally in York, Pennsylvania, and I make this point a lot to folks. It was the same kind of intensity with people fighting. Um, people fighting in the streets and the cops arresting everybody that they can see in this case and, and up to and including a car driving into a group of protesters. No one died um, and the guy served two years. Mm -hmm. um, and he was a Nazi as well. Um, but Charlottesville, it was a different dynamic coming along. I mean, it was the same, it was the same kind of um, setup where you had hundreds on their side, hundreds on our side, the police doing nothing. Mm -hmm. um, but it, but here in Charlottesville, you basically had the National Guard activated, and I was like, okay, this is serious. We heard that as we were going down. Yeah. And then we also heard that, that everything had started popping off the night before. We was driving down when they had the Tiki Torch, yes, yes. and it was like, wow, everything started already? So they said 500 Nazis were in the street, and they were fighting everybody at the statues, and I was like, oh boy, we're going to have some fun tomorrow. Sure enough, sure enough. And it was also, it, it was crazy because, um, I mean, I was in my zone much of the day, to be honest. You'll see me laughing and grinning the entire day because this so is what, what, what I do. What this were you doing what, out there? You're it was videotaping? I was, videota I was um, videotaping. I was popping off with some of the folks um, on the other side. I mean, you know, I'm one of those happy warrior types where I was just like, yo, this the, I'm here for the glory of the battle at this point when I'm in the field. And But I also know that there's a job to do. I, mean, I do take it seriously. Do not get me wrong. But, sure, so you, you know, like calling out these, these uh, calling out calling out these folks and I'm um, talking to some of the folks that know me from other things and, you know, and um. I ended up rest. I was wrestling around with folks. I um, and I got pepper spray for the first time in my life in one of these um, at one of these events. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you see, film. yeah, you see the film and you see me doing my Marcel Marceau impression there. <laughs> but uh, and even then, I was still in that zone where I was just like in a good mood, even though it sucked that I got pepper spray. But you know, you recover from it and you and you move on. So you know, things have started toning down, especially because the. Uh, the police decided that, yeah, maybe we should do something. And they shut it down. They said this was a state of emergency. Um, this is the uh, illegal march or illegal rally, mm -hmm. illegal assembly, whatever they wanted to call it. So we was all already chilled out. We was all, um, we was all just basically trying to make heads or tails of what just happened. And then we realized that everybody had been watching this live on television all over the country. It was like, oh, okay, it's gotten that far. Yeah. And... And of course, we started. They started telling us. We started getting Twitter um, messages and emails and texts from people that weren't in Charlottesville, saying all the things that they heard was going on. Like we heard, they heard that somebody gotten shot or somebody was shooting. And said, that doesn't happen. We didn't hear that. Things were so crazy. We didn't know that people were shooting. Right, right. There were shots fired. We did not know that. And, 
and tell me about you know when when you found out about Heather Heyer. Uh, well, that's the other thing. We I was chilling out at the um, across the street from a church. Everything had broken down. I I had pulled out this cooler that I had in my trunk, and I was giving people water. I was giving people mm. um, fruit and vegetables and stuff like that. Um, we were yelling at some of the uh, Nazis that were walking past us because we were all everybody was worn out at the time. We weren't really trying to fight anybody. Everybody was worn out, so we was just like screw you Nazi, and we didn't say screw. Um, we were just, we were, and and they were yelling back at us, and they just walked along, and we just let them walk along. One of them, by the way, is a guy out of Linden, New Jersey, named Ron Sheehy. Okay, a union guy, no less. So that makes us really happy that he's in the pipe for this union, but. Uh, and anyway, so, you know, we're, we're just chilling out, and I see these ambulances going by. I says, okay, I guess somebody got hurt. And we was a block away. Really? We were a block away. And um, when that, and when we found out that somebody had gotten hurt, a whole bunch of people got hurt because somebody drove a car into a bunch of people. And it was like they said, um, a, a bunch of people were hurt. Um, some people got killed. I was like, real. Some people got killed. Are you kidding me? And then they said, okay, no, it's just one person that got killed. That's still one too many. Mm -hmm. What do you mean one? Somebody got killed. Who got killed? Was it one of them or one of us? Um, and then they said it was. I mean, there was different rumors mm -hmm. about who got killed and all that. But we weren't even sure that somebody got killed. We just thought that was yet another one of those rumors. And then it was confirmed, and we were just like, oh man, that never happened before, ever. Right, it was. I had been a... to so many rallies over the past thirty years, and that's never happened before. Yeah. So tell me about coming out of Charlottesville. What that's meant for your work, and and uh, also for for the the, the Nazis. I was I was so after finding out how bad it got, um, I had gotten worn out. But um, that night, um, I, I I was done. Um, I still had to go on, and th this is now by this time I'm already a media figure. Understand? So, you know, I'm going on MSNBC talking about it, and you know, I have right, a job right. to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I'm gonna um, if I'm gonna represent anti-fascists, then um, then they need to hear from then they need to hear from us. So I went out there and started talking, and you know, after that, people started wanting to know what was um what was the next move and they and they came to me they had me on cnn and a, and a couple and npr a couple of other outlets in the wake of all of that but but the most important thing that happened was as i said earlier the battle was joined all of a sudden people who were on the sidelines who were not in charlottesville who thought that this was something to be ignored now we're starting to dox the nazis too Mm -hmm. Then you started seeing people losing their jobs again. You started seeing um, Nazis getting disowned by their families for being there. Um, it was so funny because it's like there's a scene in the movie where I say, a scene in the documentary where I say, look, people know them now. And when you go back home, folks are going to ask, why were you there? That was before I even knew that people were watching already. Mm -hmm. I didn't, Heather High was still alive when I said that. Mm -hmm. So, the fact that, number one, I should point out that my crew, we all knew that something hardcore was going to go down in Charlottesville. We were talking about it in a podcast of our own two days before. Mm -hmm. But we didn't expect this. So, when everybody started getting involved and started saying, you know what, we're gonna, we're, we are going to start fighting this back. And then Boston, the Boston Nazis decided they were going to have their little rally. So 40,000 people came out to oppose 12. <laughs> so people, and it was just basically, now we have to use this. We mm -hmm. do have to use this to keep people in the frame of mind that you got to be focused on fighting these characters no matter what the media tells you to do, and what it meant also was those Confederate monuments. Remember that the mm -hmm. Charlottesville, we were out in Charlottesville because they were trying to defend the um, Confederate statues of um, Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. And you know, everybody said, okay, if it's coming to this, those statues had to come down. Those monuments have to come down. And you know, the right did what they always do, try to make it sound like they're the victims because they're, they're tr um, their participation trophies were being taken away from them, so we was we was um, dealing with we dealing with all that, and now we're at a point where, you know, you still can't be an open Nazi without catching hell. Um, but a lot of those 
that um, were a part of Charlottesville or who were um, on their side um, were feeling it, are feeling the heat now to the point that they cannot come out as open Nazis anymore. They have to once again do the subterfuge like you see um, the flash mobs of Identity Europa or the Proud Boys pretending that they're not racist because they have black friends mm -hmm. and they have black members. You know, black people can be fascist too. So, <laughs> so that doesn't fly. And most importantly, and I got to make this point before, um, before we go too far, is that the other thing that they try to do is make us look like the aggressors to, and they are the victims. So that is what we see when we see uh, folks getting jammed up in Philly mm -hmm. um, for whatever altercations might have happened um, about a month ago today. Mm -hmm. And the thing that really irks me is that people don't realize that you have, because um, they're trying to accuse, they're trying to accuse uh, a couple of people for attacking um, two Marines um, that happen to be Mexican. So they are trying to say that racial slurs were used. Antifa don't use racial slurs. Mm -hmm. Something is going on. That, that, that reeks of fishiness. So we're going to have to see what happens in that case. But the fact that things like that is coming out um, means that someone's trying to play the play a game mm -hmm. with all of us and um, I would tell everybody when it comes to that case or whatever involves the Proud Boys or the three percenters or whatever take it with a grain of salt what's ever coming from their camp is BS and always has been okay it was one reason why it's so important to report the truth yeah. get the facts and and uh, thank exactly. you for your work and I apologize for the rambling no no you're, you're great <laughs> and, and and before we go tell us about the future and what you see okay. you've got a, another uh, film yes, we have out, another skin. film. That have another film that's coming out. It's called Skin. Um, you talked earlier about how I help people get out of the white power scene. Well, this is um, based on the story of Brian Widener, one of those um, mm -hmm. one of those Nazis that I helped get out. He was in a, a group called the Villain the Social Club, and we shot it up in Kingston, New York. Um, and ironically, the last time I was in Kingston, New York, it was a Nazi rally, but um, but we shot it up there, and it was cold. But, <laughs> and it was, uh, it, it was a really, it was an intense experience. I mean, I've never been on a movie set before and it was great. I love it. But um, it debuted at the Toronto International Film Festival back in September. Um, it got a whole bunch of standing ovations. Wow. Um, there's a, I mean, I got a standing ov ovation and it was, uh, and, and it's slated to be, it's probably going to be premiering in theaters sometime next year, um, maybe late next year, there's a lot of Oscar buzz around it. Okay. There's a lot of Oscar buzz around it. Um, the peop um, uh, it's directed by Guy Nativ, an Israeli director, and um, it's his first um, movie here in the States. Cool. Um, he, um, it's also produced by Maven Pictures, which is, which is um, run by Trudy Styler, who is Sting's wife. Oh, wow. uh, and it stars Jamie Bell as Brian Widener. Um, Jamie Bell, people might remember from the movie um, Billy Elliot. Um, I remember him because I'm on to comic books um, as um, he played the thing in the last Fantastic Four movie. And who's playing you? <laughs> Speaking of comic books, um, uh, Mike Coulter, who people might know in New Brunswick as a former uh, alum of Mason Gross, Everybody else knows him as Luke Cage. <laughs> so I got Luke Cage playing me. Um, and I should also point, and, and it's, it's great. He's been to the Melody, so he knows the ins and outs in New Brunswick. He knows the world I come from. So it's a perfect fit. I love the fact that he's playing him, and he's a good dude. I cannot wait to see how people receive him playing me. But I should also point out that there is also um, Vera Farmiga is in the movie from The Departed and Base Motel. And um, Boy in the Striped Pajamas. You also have um, Bill Camp from The Night Of. Um, people might know that HBO series. And he also, oh yeah, he's also playing Gerald Ford in this new movie Vice um, about Dick Cheney and George Bush. So this is this movie is no joke, and it's weird to see um, something a production and all of this going on because of work that I have been doing for the past 30 years. It's like I've never really looked for the spotlight or anything like that and it's kind of like the spotlight found me and I'm just like wow y'all really give a damn. It's, it, I'm still I'm still kind of choked up over the fact that people care. <laughs> but I hope it's not just because they're scared about Trump. 
Because when Trump's gone, those folks are still going to be out there trying to fight, right trying on. to cause grief. And we still got to maintain against them. So that's one thing everybody got to keep in mind. Absolutely. So tell folks how they can support your organization. I know you just announced you're mm -hmm. going to be uh, move, moving the yes. org back to yeah. New Jersey. And uh, how can folks be a part of that? Where do they go to give? Well, One People's Project is currently based in Philadelphia. And we're still going to have a Philadelphia presence. That, we just simply went to where the work was because there was a lot of Nazis there, still are. And, um, and the gun laws are a lot better um, for me. Um, <laughs> and because uh, I can carry over. There. Sure. Um, now, but thing is, there's work to be done here in Jersey now. So we figure it'd probably be good to just come back into this, come back into town where, we, where our roots are and see what we can do to help, um, help our town, make our HQ here once again. So that's happening sometime in 2019. Excellent. Um, How can people help? Can we, need, we, we need money. Yeah, all we right. Need cool. money. So I mean, what's so, the website? So we, you can go, uh, if you go to, w, uh, you go to onepeoplesproject.com and you will find, um, you know, you'll see the website. You'll see the donate buttons, one of the first things you see. <laughs> and... Uh, there's also, there's also a whole bunch of information and things out there about how to get involved. You can see something that we have called the Rogues Gallery, which is basically um, little castle bios of, all, of various people that we um, go after. Um, you can also go to idavox.com to see current news stories and alerts and events that, uh, that um, on our sidebar warning people about the next Nazi rally or just some straight up event that's happening. Um, you can go to um, on Twitter, there's IdaVox, at IdaVox OPP. Their, um, One People's Project's Twitter is um, One People's Proj. The ECT is gone. Uh, if you go on Facebook, it's, it's facebook.com slash One People Project 89. And, uh, of course, if you want to find me on Twitter, I'm D Lam and on Instagram, I'm D Lamont Jenkins there, at D Lamont Jenkins. Awesome. And, that's pretty much it in a nutshell, and I hope everybody does help because we really want to rock and roll over the next uh, over the next year or so. We don't want to play games with this nonsense anymore because it's getting intense. We got we got elected officials um, saying that there's going to be bloodshed. We just heard that from the governor of Kentucky. I said, now if we're getting to that point, all right, enough's enough. We got to do something. Well, thank you for your work, Daryl. Keep it up. Thank and you. All of you, thank you for watching. When you get done making your donation to One People's Project, please support New Brunswick today. If you like this interview and you want to see more content like that, uh, that focuses on our great city that we love so much, New Brunswick, New Jersey, please go to members.newbrunswicktoday.com and make a holiday donation. You can just check the box there if you want to make a monthly donation to help us sustain and support this organization. Thank you again, Daryl. Keep up Appreciate the good work. Thank Thanks, you. everybody, for watching, and I'll see you again soon.